Good afternoon. I'm Roger Gilbert, and this afternoon from the Milling and Grain magazine's Rongo Rongo Live Studio, we will be talking about the future of food. The effects of coronavirus have impacted all walks of life. However, agriculture seems to be coping well, and here in the UK at least. However, that's apart from the need to uh, for low low cost labour to pick our seasonal fruit and vegetables. But joining me this afternoon is Christophe Pelletier. He's a f global food and agricultural futurist and strate strategist, as well as the sensible gourmet. Christophe has written a column for Milling and Grain over several years, and some of you might well remember or be familiar with his writings. On his web website, The Sensible Gourmet, he talks exclusively about the joys of bread making. So it's quite appropriate to invite him back to our studio to look at, among other things, the future of food. Uh, welcome, Christoph. Uh, you are based, I understand, Christoph, in California. Oh, sorry. Where are you based, Christoph? No, I'm based in British Columbia in Canada. Ah, okay. Sorry, I knew the time difference was uh, little, the West Coast. A little bit north of California. <laughs> A little bit north, okay. <laughs> Uh, I hope uh, the lockdown is not too serious where you are uh, and that uh, these, your community is surviving well. Yeah, things are not too bad here. We've been lucky. Uh, we didn't have too much contamination. So, uh, of course, we have to be cautious, but uh, certainly nothing comparable with some of the you know, countries in Europe or mm. in some states in the U.S. at the moment. So I still can go for a bike ride uh, when I want, so mm. it's okay. Yeah. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to talk about the food industry specifically and, and if possible, about what you would envisage the impact of coronavirus is going to have on our retail food outlets, for example, uh, taking into consideration online food ordering, deliveries, pickups of those orders. Is that the future as you might see it? Well, uh, the retail, of course, especially the, the, the modern retails uh, model has been all about uh, having as many people entering the stores and moving around freely and uh, touching everything and, uh, and bumping into each mm -hmm. other very often with their carts or with our carts. Uh, so it changes quite a few things. Uh, the retail well, has done quite well because people were rushing to buy uh, goods, uh, the, the fear of maybe missing on something. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, with the uh, recommendations for social distancing, then uh, things have uh, had to change. And there was, of, of course, the risk for the staff to get contaminated by some of the visitors to the stores, but also for the people visiting the stores also being contaminated by other shoppers. So uh, they had to adapt and adjust a few things. Uh, so what we've seen now, especially the big change, because in the smaller stores it's not as bad, and the big change, they had to basically organize a, you know, you can come in only when somebody comes out, you have to wait outside in long lineups, and some lineups were pretty much going all around <laughs> the building. Uh, so uh, what we also have seen, a lot of people being worried of getting the disease, uh, prefer to stay home and place some orders. So what I've seen, at least I can talk about the situation that I see around here where I live. Uh, the retail, especially the big retailers, have been really taken by surprise. Uh, mm -hmm. And the amount of online orders has uh, skyrocketed. And they are not able to deal with the volume that, that they have. So mm -hmm. what they had to do was to try to find people to, to work. And at the moment, if well, many people have lost their jobs, the retailers are among the, the, the sectors that are hiring uh, the most. But they also have difficulties to find people because, well, they are not very high wages and mm -hmm. low qualifications. And there are a number of people who prefer maybe to wait at home until their job comes back, if it ever does. Uh, so they're struggling to find people to also be able to train uh, people in their stores. Mm -hmm. So what you see is a big backlog of orders. So people have ordered online, but they're not going to get their goods, you know, tomorrow morning. They're going to have to wait quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, what you also see because of you know, bringing in new people who are not experienced, uh, orders are not always exactly what the customers wanted. Uh, I've heard recently somebody who had ordered some pork tenderloin and got some bacon instead. <laughs> so <laughs> there's some frustrations. Uh, 
So I, I think there was the trend towards more, you know, digital uh, retailing. I think that, that the situation today is certainly probably going to push in that direction uh, uh, more so. Um, what I expect, though, is that maybe we're going to see uh, two different types of food retailing, uh, perishables and non-perishables. Uh, for for, for non-perishables, you know, it canned goods or frozen stuff. Basically, uh, you can wonder if you really need a store. Uh, people know the packaging, they know the product. Uh, now they can find online all the specifications of the product. Uh, you can put all your traceability if you want. You know how is the pizza made, where the wheat come from, that made the dough, where does the, mm. the bacon come from, and what did the pigs eat? So you can really play your whole digital uh, information about the products. People could find all that information just place an order because. Mm. Now, is it really essential in this day and age to have uh, real estate to basically put just cans? Uh, you could probably serve customers just as well, especially if they're afraid to go to your store or if they can't have the freedom they had before and they don't want to wait in line. Uh, why not just have your warehouse, you know, where you store your goods before putting them in the store and fill the orders? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a trend that has started some time ago, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's not new, but I think it could accelerate because of this, and people might find actually more convenience in doing so. Uh, now, going to the perishables, then it's a different category of products, and let's face it, we're all the same. We like to be able to see and touch the fruit and the veggies mm -hmm. and look yeah. at the meat and choose, you know, if you want a lean meat or fattier meat. Or, uh, so I think that will be more difficult to uh, for a retailer to fill online orders for people uh, for the perishables because, yeah, they want to use their senses a bit more uh, mm -hmm. when they buy those products. When you mm -hmm. when you buy a can, basically, well, you know, a can mm -hmm. is a can, there is a label on it. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, although people don't want to have a can that has bump in, uh, a dent in it. but. <laughs> Beyond that, you know, it's not that it, it's very important which which can you get. Uh, but when it comes to choosing an apple, when it comes to choosing a steak, uh, people uh, want to, to, to see what they buy before they, they make the decision. So it could very well be that we might have, and I don't know, you know, uh, how, how long ahead mm -hmm. I'm talking here, but that we might have uh, stores that are going to do really the more non-perishable commodity type of stuff uh, through online orders and people visiting the stores a little bit like it used to be like it is an, uh, on the farmers market more of an interaction with the person at the counter uh, and the person in the counter maybe knowing more the, the customers mm -hmm. knowing what they like so that they can give them the better service i think with this crisis uh, what i see between the big retailers and the pop and mom stores, uh, that level of service, that level of attention is quite uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I've seen also uh, with the, uh, the virus crisis uh, with the big retailer, they seem to have had some serious supply chain problems. Uh, of course, the, the volume of, uh, of shopping has increased and a lot of people, you know, the whole flour was mm -hmm. gone, uh, mm -hmm. the yeast is gone because people yeah. are baking. Uh, there were people basically uh, looting the, uh, the meat department completely, and uh, the, the freezers are full, I'm sure, in some places. Uh, but uh, the whole industry has had a hard time being able to cope with that, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't have the flexibility. And we have seen for quite some time, actually, the meat section was kind of half empty at least, mm -hmm. if not more. And it was not just for a couple of days, that has been for uh, several mm -hmm. weeks. So uh, I think what they're also going to have to do is to think about how to organize the supply chain, how to be able to handle such fluctuations uh, when there is a problem, uh, because the whole system had been built kind of, nobody wants to have inventory really, they just want the, the, mm. the product to flow all along from the, the producer all the way to the consumer, mm. uh, but uh, not having inventories, of course, when there is a problem, when there is a glitch like we have, mm. uh, it brings its sets of problems. And I think the retailers, with well, basically the whole value chain is going to have to think very carefully about, okay, what kind of contingency plan can we have uh, mm. should this situation happen again?
Uh, I think we all, you know, the whole value chain has learned already a lot of lessons uh, over the last three months. Um, and they are already, you know, working on finding some solutions. But uh, I, th I think, yeah, we're going to have to now keep in mind, hey, if something goes wrong, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And before the virus, you know, it was always issues about more about the um, climate change and how it could affect uh, all food supplies and so on. But it was not really a real life exercise. Uh, here, we have been taken by surprise within a few weeks uh, uh, about what does it mean all of a sudden if your supply chain is not adapted to uh, this new situation? So I, I think there's going to be a lot of brainstorming to be done, a lot of solutions to be found. And uh, that's going to be an exercise that's going to be, it's going to include the consumers as well. Uh, consumers are going to have to think, you know, also, we took for granted, I think, a lot of our food supply, especially in developed countries, of course. Yeah. And maybe it's not that obvious. Uh, we see also a lot of discussions more about the role of agriculture and protecting your local agriculture. So this crisis brings some good in the sense that we are realizing that, uh, well, food supply is not a given, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to uh, constantly work on making it work. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, there will be enough people who are going to bring those issues I hope not too much from an ideological point of view or trying to push any particular agenda, but really think about, okay, the purpose here as human society is that we should well, meet our needs and be able to cover our needs when, when needed. And how can we do that, especially when there is something as disruptive as this new situation? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a an overarching uh, view on a, on a lot of areas from a consumer point of view. But what I'm thinking about specifically is innovation. I mean, innovation in the past in, in our industry, agricultural industry, has all been about driving down costs, improving quality, making sure, as you say, that uh, the chain, uh, the production chain works and it's a smooth flow of products through, through to the consumer. But what about local producers? What about picking of... Uh, uh, seasonal crops like we have in, here in the UK where we have to import uh, Rom Romanians, for instance, to fly them in because locals don't want to be that close to each other in, in a field of uh, vegetables or something. So, you know, is, is local uh, production still going to uh, play a part in the future of our food supply or are we going to go more mechanical and more robotic and etc., more big business? Um, what's your view yeah, on okay. that subject? Yeah, there are many levels in this question. Yeah. Uh, first, about uh, well, importing labor forms. Mm. Uh, what you're say, saying about the UK, well, it's the same all across Europe. Uh, I, Germany, I think, has organized some charter planes also, I believe, from Eastern Europe to bring uh, agricultural laborers to deal with horticultural products. Uh, here in, uh, in North America, what we've heard lately a lot were uh, asparagus producers yeah. who need foreign workers. And in North America, most of them come from Mexico and Central America. And it brings quite a few problems. In the region where I live, uh, there are lots of orchards. And a lot of the workforce also working in the orchards come from Mexico, come from Central America. So the government here has also chartered some planes and they're going to bring the foreign workers, and they're going to quarantine them for two weeks somewhere uh, around the production areas mm. so that at least the farmers have the workforce. Because what you see is in developed countries, a lot of people are not, even the ones who don't have jobs at the moment, are not very interested in doing that kind of work. Uh, recently, I was reading about an orchardist in the region here uh, there were some people who wanted to work in the orchard, and he said, well, the first day I didn't make them come at 6 in the morning, I'd make them come only at 9, so that I wouldn't be too rough on them. And But the second day they didn't show up, because, well, I suppose the back was a little sore, uh, things like that. And, and people, and I think it's a very good lesson, that people don't realize how hard work that is, mm. and it doesn't pay very well. So. Uh, the whole system has been built about you know, producing at the lowest cost possible and bringing foreign workers is part of that model. 
Uh, and we're not going to be able to change that. I believe the only country that has been able to kind of, well, at least that's kind of part of a resolution from those people, is, uh, is France. They have been able to have about 40,000 people volunteering to work on farms, uh, but they have volunteered uh, after one or two days of work. We'll see what how many of them are left. <laughs> but, uh, and I think they did that by basically saying that the money you make on top of that uh, is not going to affect basically your unemployment uh, money. Mm. So people kind of have this feeling that well they will be, they're going to uh, to win on both uh, on both sides. So, but we'll see. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, but the issue of uh, intensive labor in certain mm. productions is uh, is not new. And I know that the researchers at the uh, Agricultural University in Wageningen and in the Netherlands have been working for many years now, probably a decade or so, on developing some robots uh, that would pick uh, tomatoes and pick strawberries and pick cucumbers. Uh, and I think that if all of a sudden, yeah, we have to basically waste a lot, to lose a lot of food just because we don't have the workforce, uh, it certainly would be an incentive uh, to uh, try to replace people with robots or any kind of automation. Uh, after that, of course, is always uh, the economic side of things. Uh, how much does it cost uh, to do this with robots compared with uh, foreign workers? Uh, and at the moment, we're kind of at a crossroads because we don't know how long this situation is going to last. You know, mm. we, we hear a lot about the hope of having a vaccine, and maybe it will come, maybe it'll last one year, maybe two years, but maybe like with AIDS, the vaccine is never going to show up, mm. and we're going to be stuck with a, a much uh, this kind of situation for much longer. So for a lot of businesses, I can understand it's going to be a problem of... Uh, is it worth investing in this? You know, is it is it this situation? Is it going to last so long that yeah, that's the way of the future? Mm -hmm. Or am I in this kind of trouble just temporarily, and then maybe I should just well, forget about it, or we'll see later? Uh, I don't know. I think every business will have to make a decision sure. on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, but I suspect that like every time that you have a problem, that's what basically uh, triggers a lot of uh, innovation. Uh, how do you solve your problem? And well, I remember in my first book, I had made a list of things about innovation. And one of the reasons, uh, you know, innovation is not always for convenience or for economic purposes. Sometimes it's about survival. And when it comes to food, food is about life and death. And uh, maybe, uh, yeah, just the fact that you want to be able to eat every day, even in developed countries, then it's going to trigger more innovation or maybe find solutions that are maybe less sophisticated but very efficient nonetheless and at a lower cost than the solutions that were developed today. Because let's face it, we were also in an innovation uh, culture that mm. was, you know, startup, tech startups. Uh, and with that, a lot of investors behind uh, who wanted to have a return rather quickly. So looking at kind of high-end solutions, but maybe, you know, we have some low-tech solutions today, we have some high-tech solutions, but maybe we can find solutions that are somewhere in between and also in terms of costs mm -hmm. uh, uh, and how it affects margins and prof profitability, maybe a little in between. I mm -hmm. think now is the time for a lot of people when we see all the problems that appear in the whole production and supply chain, uh, yeah, it's the time to, to think of, uh, of innovations. And mm -hmm. I would say, farmers, if you have issues, throw your issues, ask the questions. There's probably somebody somewhere who is working in his garage about a little something that might bring you a solution. So today, I think, is a time for collaboration. Uh, we have to forget about our differences. We're all in this together. Uh, we were talking so much about innovation recently before the crisis. Well, now we have a good reason to innovate and, and find all sorts of solutions. So really now is the work to work together, to communicate to you know, people who have problems. Tell what your problems are, people who have solutions. Explain what your solutions can be. And when people hear something, they're going to call you and they're going to say, hey, you know what, maybe I can help you. Maybe I have something for you or maybe you have something for me. Uh, and, and I think that's what we need to, to foster. You know, that's the kind of 
uh, attitude that we have. Today we must forget about differences, about ideology, you know, agriculture should be this way or mm. that way. Uh, it can be a combination of this and that. Mm. Uh, what we need to look at, you know, what does work for the short term, but also in the long term, uh, and have a, a, an open-minded conversation. And unfortunately, mm. I've been frustrated over the last year, the last few years, about how not so open-minded the conversation about agricultural systems was. Mm. It was very sectarian, very polarized. And maybe here we have an opportunity to overcome those differences. Maybe not. I, you know, I suspect some will and some won't. But mm. yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay, Christoph, I think there's a very powerful message there is that innovation in times of necessity bring about change that uh, solve problems and that m anybody can be innovative in in the pandemic that we we're currently facing and uh, on that note of strong innovation and a look to the future in those terms thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon and uh, good luck to you in uh, up in british columbia and all the best for the future look forward to reading you, you in the magazine much. at some point christoph Thank you, Roger. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.